Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beamless and Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network here as always with my co-host and Hall of Famer, Steve Flink. The Sunshine Double is now complete, and I don't do this on every episode, Steve, but standing O to both Grigor Dimitrov and Danielle Collins right there, right? <laughs> I mean, both. I don't think it was expected. Um I'll throw some things out there, but Grigor and Danielle, I mean, my gosh, heck of a heck of a run. And I know Grigor didn't win it, but still amazing run by Grigor to me. Yeah, well, he he would tell you that in a way he did win it. I mean, he felt that way after the final. I can understand that because he's nearly out of there early. He's down a set and five two in the tiebreaker. He could have been out of that tournament in the second, third round, and then he survives her kosh. We'll talk about that later, I, I think. And then, but it, but eventually, you know, goes right through Carlos in a brilliant display. And then Zarev in three hard fought sets before it all caught up to him in the final against Sinner. But he had accomplished so much by then to be in the finals, to be back in the top 10 now, that he had every right to regard it as a triumph rather than a, a disappointing losing final. So a, a great effort from him. It is almost comparable to Collins, but for her, obviously, biggest title of her career. And uh, to, to beat Rabakana in straight sets, you know, in five and three in the final, and having uh, played so well to get there, she lost a set early and then really went through the field cleanly from there. And it's interesting because, it really, as we all know, she announced that she's going to retire at the end of the year. I think she wants to have a baby and there's all those reasons it seemed like good reasons for her to go and i still think she she will live by that on the other hand let's see what happens the rest of the year now even if she hardly wins matches the rest of the year she she will remember this this time in miami and and be very appreciative of it because she came into the tournament 53 and has really leapfrogged from there so i i think that uh she's got a lot to be proud of she you know when she's right she's an interesting player david when she's right you know, she can do something like this. When things are a little bit off, then, you know, she can lose a lot of early on matches too. That's what makes her kind of intriguing, captivating player. You never quite know what's going to happen, but she will always give you full effort. She's a great competitor. Yes. I mean, un like she was unseated, like you said, ranked 53 at the start of the tournament. Um, now 20, now she's going to be ranked 22nd in the world. It's the uh, second unseated woman. To win the Miami Open, the lowest ranked woman to win it. Um, she beats five seeds, including, like you said, Rabakina in the final. Um, again, very, very impressive. Grigor, I mean, Grigor, what? In 2017, he wins Cincy in the ATP year-end finals. He's made the semis of three of the four slams. We all remember the Aussie Open semi against Rafa when he lost 7-5 in the fifth. That was a crazy good match. Um I mean, this tennis though, at Grigor for 32 years old, it's it's a reincarnation. He not, I mean, you could just see the appearance. He's extremely fit, but the movement at 32, Steve, the movement at 32 is simply remarkably remarkable to me. He he's moving around like he's 24 years old. Yeah, I think he's playing better, by the way, than he did in 17. I mean, there was. Yes, he got to three. That was a strange year in some ways. Roger and Rafa coming back, and they claimed all four of the slams. Novak was going through some elbow difficulties. He went, he, he had an off year. There was sort of a, an opening in the game for somebody like him. He took full advantage of played tremendous tennis. But I honestly think his level is higher right now as he climbs into the bottom of the top ten. I think he's going to nine in the world now. And Grigor, I just feel like that the kind of tennis he's playing is, is even more imposing, you know, more powerful. He's, he's able to dictate more forehand is better than it was. Then the back ends, every bit as good as it was then. And the serve I think is better than it was then. So you could say maybe he's not quite as fast as he approaches 33 as he was back then, but he still moves beautifully and he's incredibly fit. So I think we're, you know, and listen, Historically, he's had very good results, been on clay. So there's no reason that he can't have built some momentum here to do some good things in Monte Carlo and beyond. And then he's been a semifinalist at Wimbledon. 2014, he lost to Novak and almost went five. He had set points to take it to a fifth. So we know what he can do on every surface. U.S. Open semifinals where he beat Roger and lost to Medvedev. So it's in 19. So, you know, he's... He's a great all-surface player who's now, I think, is going to make the most of the next 
18 months to two years. The window is there for him to play great, really right up, I should say two years, because right up to 35, I think he can stay in this region. Let's hope you're right, because he's awesome to watch. And he had a trifecta of match wins uh, this past week, which was incredible. We'll start with Herkosh in the round of 16. I mean, it was a third set tiebreaker. Crazy type of deal where um, Herkosh, it's 2-2 in the tiebreaker, I believe. It was 2-2. Yes. Um, right. Herkosh has an easy ball. It's it, For all intents and purposes, Herkosh was winning the point. It was a sitter, but he had to run up to the net. His foot, Herkosh's foot hits the bottom of the net. Gives a huge break uh, to Grigor with that point. Grigor winds up winning that tiebreaker and winning, and hence winning the match. You know, he's an interesting guy, David. Uh, Herkash is is so he's so emotional. You and he's so easy going off the court. He seems like a teddy bear off the court. You listen to him talk, and he's obviously a, a exceedingly nice guy on the court. He can let his emotions get the better of him. I think he did there. He knew he touched the net. I think he was more angry with himself than he was mm -hmm. at the umpire. We'll never know, but you got to get on with it after that. It's still, you're still only three, two down and he all lost at seven, three, but he was pretty much, he was essentially gone after that point. And that's, that's a and shame. And Grigor was tired, Steve. That helped that yeah. whole pause like that helped him. Yeah, it did. It did. It was a reprieve. It was a break. And, and also he could see, he could see that uh, Hubie was imploding. So that that only encouraged Grigor all, all the more. It's too bad because I've seen a lot of Herkosh matches, close lo losses. He loses a lot of tough final set tie breaks or 7-5 in the third. So many close matches. I often think the five setter to Medvedev in Australia, I often think that the difference is not, it's not his tennis. It's what's inside his ears. I don't mean, and that's true of so many players. I don't mean to pick on him for that, but I feel like, you know, that's what's held him back from maybe finding a place in the bottom of the top five in the world instead of the bottom of the top 10. And uh, it, it's too bad. And this was another one of those instances. And you could see he was just furious and it was bad luck, but you're, it's, it's not like it suddenly put you down match points. There was time to recover, but he didn't. And then the, the quarterfinal Grigor had with Carlos Alcaraz. I mean, we were looking forward to seeing that and my God, did he put a beating on Carlos and Carlos admitted it. I mean, First set races up 3-0, had a couple break points to go 4-0. He didn't get it, um, but he winds up winning the first set 6-2. The second set, he's up 4-1. He had a break point up to go 5-1. Then it got a little interesting. Well, a little he got interesting. You're right. Carlos... It, got, it got interesting because he got a little tight there, David. I think he was disappointed by missing. It was a second serve return that he missed off the forehand when he had the break point for 5-1. And then Carlos managed to get the hold from there. And the next game was the only time Grigor lost his serve in the whole match was in the next game. It was kind of a feeble game. Carlos serves a good game. It's for all. And you and I were texting at the time. And it, it, I think we both thought, oh, boy, this could be this match could be turning irreversibly in the direction of, of Alcaraz. But all credit to this is where I admired Grigor the most because things were just flowing so freely for him up until 6-2, 4-1. Everything going his way, he was in the zone. He did, he could do no wrong. But when you lose those three games, and when you almost had it wrapped up, with you seal the break point for five one, it's over. And suddenly it's four all. He served a really good game at four all, including a really an excellent kick serve on the sideline that got him to forty fifteen and the ad court, and then an ace at forty thirty down the tee, clutch game, and then broke him in the final game. The fact that he grouped regrouped so well. After the three game laps, just that told that, that just showed us too that not only physically is, is he at an all time high, but mentally he's more stable and able to recover. You know, he, he, he like anybody else, he can choke here and there, but boy, did he get on with it from four all. I think, Steve, um, a person like Grigor who has had a ton of experience that helped him in that situation. I think if it was a younger player who maybe not have had the amount of experience that Grigor has. They may not have been able to hold when you're up 4-1, break point 5-1. Now all of a sudden it's 4-4 and things are turning. I think experience helped Grigor immensely in that situation. Well, it did. Yeah, it did. But absolutely. But Carlos was puffing his chest. You could feel like Carlos had that sense of, that he was going to be able to get out of this precarious position he was in. I felt like it was the only time he looked confident. And he was quickly deflated again, thanks to Grigor's professionalism and discipline. So... 
Yeah, it was a yeah, that was I I I don't think I've seen him play a better complete match than he did there. And Carlos, the comment he made afterwards, he felt like a thirteen year old, and that was a tremendous compliment to Grigor because basically he was saying he took me to school and I didn't have any answers. I couldn't figure anything out out there. I didn't know what he was going to do, and I didn't know how to stop it. So that's you can't get a bigger compliment than that because I've heard Carlos after other losses where he's been very self critical and he even compared this to the loss he had against Grigor, a three-setter last fall. And he said he felt like he played much better in this match than he did in the three-set loss. So that, again, tells you how well uh, that Grigor played. And then the the semi, right? He plays, he plays. Uh, I'm sorry, Sasha Zverev. Zverev, seven to one, head-to-head, -head, Steve. Uh, it's been really one-sided, but you you didn't know. I mean, was, was Grigor going to keep that hot, insane level on con to continue uh, in this match, this one got dicey as well. First set on serve until Grigor breaks uh, zero of at five four to win the win the set. Um, yeah, and that was and and that was a dangerous moment from Zverev's standpoint because he had thirty love in that game, and then he made a one great acrobatic backhand volley winner from Grigor got him back in the game, but then three pretty bad errors from Grigor that after that, I mean from from Sasha after that, Sasha. and then including the very kind of wobbly forehand down the line that went wide on set point down. Uh, he had to have been really disappointed because most of his holds have been pretty comfortable. And now here he is looking like he's going to at least get to a tie break. That hurt him, but he did battle back to take the second and a tie break before Grigor beat him in three. Grigor the second set, Steve, was interesting because Zverev, uh, Grigor almost won that in two. I mean, Zverev was down four, five, love 30. Yes, in love that 30. second set, he won four points in a row to hold. Yeah. Um, for five five, and then I I noticed Vera's backhand down the line late in that set started to really work uh, dividends for 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 Zverev to win some big big points. Zverev wins that tiebreaker seven four, and now you're like, is Grigor gonna have enough in the tank to win that third set? And sure enough, he did. Oh, he did. Yeah, he had plenty in the tank, and he also just continued to serve with great precision and and consistency and you know he never got broken in the three sets the one set he loses as a breaker so i think he would that also made him feel gave him a lot of inner security feeling like okay i'm still serving well i'm still playing well he squeezed out a tie break i didn't quite get him at four or five love 30 when i might have been able to end it but there was no sense uh, no no lack of resolve and he was down a break point at one two in that third set yeah. too. That would have been tough if he brought that. Yeah, that, that that could have yeah that could have killed him, but it didn't. No, he he was very poised on the break point, and and that was one of the few opportunities that Sarah that Sasha had the whole match on Grigor's serve, and then finally it was it was a uh, uh, Grigor who got the break, and and then he served a love game closing it out, came in served and volleyed a few times, played a terrific last game. So yeah, that was that was a tr a wonderful follow up to what he'd done against Carlos. The three three break point was interesting. I mean, Grigor was totally in control of the point. Now he would have hit a volley no matter if the ball that Zverev hit hit the top of the net or not. But Zverev did hit the top of the net, and Grigor had to adjust a little bit, and he hits a winning volley uh, falling down. It looked pretty cool in the highlights, but even if it didn't hit the tape, Grigor was covering that shot. Well, yeah, um, but it was beautifully done on the dive there to put the forehand volley away, and and yeah, it was a good game that he played there, very timely, and then no hesitation the way he closed it out from there. So look, I mean he. It was a much tougher match than Carlos, but it was a really a really hard earned victory, and and uh, that and got him. He had him a day off, Steve. He had a day off for the fun. Yeah. I thought like the day off could help him. We all were thinking. I mean, Sinner. I mean, God, going into that match, he was what twenty one and one. He's now twenty two and one, forty two and three since the U.S. Open. I mean, yeah. I was thinking, all right, Sinner's he's playing unbelievable, but at least Grigor has a day off because um, he had played the the quarter the semi on Friday. So he didn't do anything on Saturday. Um, sure enough, he just ran into a buzzsaw yesterday. Yeah, no, that time factor was insignificant as it turned out because you lose three and one. I mean, it, stamina never came into the into play there. He had one opening in the, early on, David, and that's when uh, he'd actually served a couple of love games at the beginning. Grigor held at love twice, and now he's at 2-1 with a break point for 3-1. And... And he got back a 128 mile an hour serve down the tee for a great serve from first serve from uh, Yannick. And, and, and 
he was in pretty good shape in the point, Grigor was, and he, so he went for an inside out forehand. It wasn't really going to be a winner, but it might have set up the next shot to win the point, and he missed it wide by probably two inches. And, and, that, and that was literally the only – he never had another opportunity like that. And so 11 out of 13 games from there for Sinner, and he just got better and better, and his passing shots were, were just scintillating. And a couple – one forehand down the line pass, another back and down the line pass, out of your, lifted out of your dreams. And he served better and better. And, and, and again, it was another one of those typically Sinner – I'm mentioning a couple of golden moments, but by and large it was just bread and butter – very simple formula. He doesn't try to overplay anything. It gives you nothing. And I, I felt like, yeah, I mean, Sinner the last two rounds. In the meantime, he's come off a one and two win over Medvedev. Nobody does that to Medvedev. I mean, he's lost two matches like that in his career. One of them was a three and love loss to Rafa in the finals of Canada back in 19 when he had his first great summer, Medvedev. Uh, it just doesn't happen to him like that. I've never look him, seen him look so dismayed coming off a loss as he walked to the net he almost felt humiliated and you know he had a few break point opportunities here and that he wasn't able to break Yannick he had break points early in both sec first and second sets but he was just thoroughly outplayed he tried to actually bring some of the same offense that we saw from him in Australia when we when a lot of us thought that was because he was fatigued after three five setters and felt like he had to play that way and it almost got him the victory because Medvedev was up two sets to love in that Australian Open final, but he couldn't close it. This time, now, it, he started to press a bit. He, it, it didn't work as well because I felt like Sinner defended better off of the, Daniel's biggest shots. And Daniel then started to miss. Daniel started to press. It wasn't an avalanche of errors, but th those that he made were very costly. And then he, he couldn't extract any from Yannick. That was, a, that, was, that was fascinating because there's five in a row for Sinner against Medvedev. But the previous four were all, there were a couple last fall, you know, a six and six final, and then another match, three, th tough three sets. Then the year end championships was also three sets. And finally the five setter in Australia. So you never, not, nobody was anticipating. And I remember even listening to Jim Curry on the commentary early on in the first set, thinking that, oh no, one break's not going to be enough in a match like this. And you could tell he, he was expecting something close. We all were. And, and yet he went out and just beat the daylights out of Medvedev. And he's in a tough spot now, David. We talked about this after Indian Wells when Carlos beat Medvedev. I mean, here's Medvedev getting to the latter stages of all these tournaments, getting to all these finals. Hasn't won a tournament since Rome last year. He, you know, because the likes of Aquas and Sinner are always getting in his way. And obviously Novak did in the U.S. Open finals. So his consistency is commendable. But I'm sure he's saying to himself right now, what do I what am I going to do against these two young young guys, Sinner and Alcaraz? That's what he's particularly worried about now. How do I how am I going to beat them? And obviously, he owned Sinner for a long time until it turned last fall. And now it looks like it might be permanent. And then with Carlos, yes, he beat him at the U.S. Open in a great performance in the semis. But otherwise, Carlos beat him in the year end championships, beat him in Indian Wells. It looks like he still has his number. So. I must say, I have a lot of sympathy for Medvedev, who's a hardworking professional and completely dedicated to his craft and a Grand Slam champion, having won the 21 U.S. Open. But right now, he things are things are not looking that positive for him in terms of what he can do against his chief rivals. The chief rivals, right? I mean, Sinner, my my calculations are correct. He lost seven games in the semis and final, and yeah. that's the likes yeah. of Medvedev and Dimitrov. I mean, that's impressive as. As I'll get out. I want to mention a couple other uh, moments in the tournament that were uh, really entertaining, not just for me, but for all tennis fans. The quarterfinal match between Maria Sakari and uh, um, Lena Rabakina. Um, Rabakina wins the first set, has two match points in the second set. Maria saves them, right? Wins the second set in the tiebreaker. Maria then saves two more match points at 3-5 in the third. Steve holds that game to go 4-5. What does Rebecca do? Rebecca to do? She shows that she has the best first serve in the game and comes up. She loses the first point, go love 15, then four huge first serves in a row to take the match. Yeah, including a cut two or three aces in there. It was that was a, that was a wonderful way to close out the match. That was probably the best women's match of the tournament. But you see that match and also the match that she played Rebecca against Vika Azarenka 
which was a weird match. He won the first, uh, uh, Rubakina won the first, dropped the second, six love and won seven, six in the third. These matches, you know, all of these hard fought contests, I think caught up to her a bit when she played Danielle Collins in the final. We'll never know how much, but she's had that problem most of the year. She's had fantastic results and she's been enormously consistent, but a lot of three setters. And sometimes you have too many in one tournament. It, it, it's going to, it's going to really prevent you from, and, and I thought in a way she wasn't quite fresh enough in the final. We'll never know because Colin saved 10 out of 11 break points. She was, she was outstanding under pressure on her serve on the big break points when she had to be. And that included three all in both sets. First set three all, which could have turned that set that eventually went to Colin seven five. Long, long game, a bunch of break points against Colin. She saves them. Three all second set, very similar. If if Rabakina can break there, maybe it goes her way. Instead, she doesn't break and she gets broken herself in the next game. And Collins eventually serves it out after having to face more break points in the last game. So it really was a question of the big points. There wasn't that much that separated him. Five and three looks fairly straightforward. It wasn't quite as comfortable as the scoreline, but Collins deserved it because she just kept coming at her. She kept forcing the issue. And, and in the end, the aggression paid off. And I, I do want to highlight uh, one other player because she had two amazing wins. Um, Alexandrova. She beats Pagula 6-4 in the third. And the one before that, the match before that, she smacked Iga Sviatek 6-4, 6-2. I mean, to, to get back-to-back -back wins against Sviatek and Pagula, I mean, that's there's something to be said for doing that. Oh, yeah. I mean, Pagula never had a chance. I mean, excuse me. Iga never had a chance. Pagula did. She got back into the third set, went up 4-3 on serve. But Alexandrova, sometimes, it's like, it, it's like poor Pagula. I she didn't have any say in the conversation the last three games. There wasn't really much that she did wrong. This girl just picked her apart and won those last three games. And it was very impressive. And I, I thought she was maybe going to have a pretty decent chance against Collins, <clears throat> but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. You know, uh, Danielle was in such good form by then that she knocked her off in straight. And coming into that match, I thought it was kind of a coin flip, whether Alex and Grover or Collins would win it. Good, good effort. Uh, one other note off the court that has been noteworthy. Um, Novak Djokovic and Goran Ivanisevic are no longer working together. Um, you know, it's April Fool's, so no one will believe me when I'd say, you were the new coach for Novak Djokovic, but we know that's <laughs> not the case. We are recording this on April 1st, which is April Fool's Day. Um, but no, obviously... Um, Interesting decision. I mean, Novak, I mean, when you say Novak struggled, it's all relative, right? I mean, he's, his results are so amazing. When we say his struggle, that's, that's, that's amazing results for 99% of the other players. Um, it'll be interesting to see his next move with, with his team. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm still a little confused. He talked about them, how they, they started in 18 and my, I think maybe he talked to him in 18, but it, Gorn was not really fully a, a board until 19, but what a run from 19 through 23. And that included a couple of three slam seasons in 21 and 23. And I mean, last year, one of his very best seasons. And yes, you're right. So Novak, all he's played this year was Australia and Indian Wells and had the semi in Australia and lost to Sinner. And then obviously the very disappointing loss in Indian Wells. So it's hard to know. I think maybe it, it just, Djokovic came away from Indian Wells very uh, disappointed because he had put so much time in trying to prepare for it, got to California so early. I think maybe in his mind was expecting to make a real bid to win it, and it didn't happen. So nobody can – it's not that clear from Djokovic's message or from any of the reports that have come out is exactly what the reason was. But sometimes, you know, the, these after a period of years, of uh, someone like Novak has done this, you know, he had some years with Becker You you want to hear a different voice. At least that, that's what I think he feels. Plus, he did admit in his message that they always got along great off the court. They didn't always get along so well on. There were times he really vented at Gorin during matches. And I don't know whether part of that was he felt like Gorin had not given him the right advice and therefore he was playing him. It wasn't that clear, but there would be some bickering and they'd, they'd go at each other a little bit and you'd see the expression on Gorin's face. So I think there were times when where there were honest disagreements about how to proceed with the matches. But off the court, I think they were pretty good buddies. I certainly hope that the personal friendship uh, lingers, I mean, that, that it endures.
Oh, well said. Yeah, I hope so too. And again, it will be interesting to see Novak's next move. There's some rumors going on out there who he might select next, but um, nothing uh, formal as of this re as of this recording. So with that, um, you know, the thing about level is a quick okay. comment on that. He had that hitting partner, and I don't know the guy's name, but if you watched a lot of those matches the last few years, the hitting partner would often seemingly be saying more to Novak than even Gorin was when they were allowed to coach you know when he was down that end of the court and the hitting partner seemed to be really quite vocal with him and quite uh, aggressive and in, in, in a good way about telling what he thought he should do so I'm wondering whether this guy might step in in a larger way and 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 be the at least the interim coach because it appeared to me that he was capable of doing it yeah yeah well we'll, we'll see it'll definitely be interesting news when it's formally announced with that uh, being said, the Sunshine Double is now done. It's such a great time uh, for tennis fans, especially in the U.S., to watch those two events. We now uh, move on to the clay season. I feel like the clay season is pretty long. We have some tournaments in the U.S. right now on the WTA side. It's Charleston, and on the men's side, you got the U.S. men's um, clay courts down in Houston. Um, there's some other tournaments going around, too. But uh, – it's a good, good few weeks in the States with the Sunshine Double. Overall, I give it an, an A, both those tournaments. It was it was good for the players. It was good for the fans. It was good for the, the people in attendance and the viewers who were watching on TV. Overall, I, I give it an A, Steve. Yeah, I would too. I would too. And then, of course, the nice part of it is, okay, there's just a brief little stretch here, and then suddenly next week we're going to be at it in Monte Carlo. And I, I feel like that's going to be really fascinating to see whether Nadal is actually ready to, to play. And if he is, how well does he do? Can he get two, three, four matches in? Does he, does he get injured again? We just don't know. Djokovic with a chance for a revival here. Sinner trying to keep his great hardcore form going out of the clay. And we know how much Carlos loves the clay. So I think he'll be delighted to be back out there on, on the dirt. So a lot to look forward to in, in that in that first Masters 1000 in Monte Carlo. Agreed. Thanks for your time tonight, Steve. Thank you, David.